Guys, welcome back to Let's Be Frank, the home of men's mental health, and welcome to a gripping and powerful two-part special, where we dive deep into the harrowing story of Rob Parks. You may remember Rob as a victim in Channel 4's special feature, Black Widow, showcased on 24 Hours in Police Custody. Join us as we sit down with Rob and allow him to open up and talk about the turbulent and tragic journey of his marriage. Listen as he shares his truth. Guys, welcome to Married to the Black Widow. But first of all, as always, Mr. Ryan Smith, how are you feeling tonight, mate? I'm good, mate. And, it, and to say we we release an episode on a Wednesday, but we're recording on a Wednesday now, so this is this is new. This is new. So yeah, let's um no, but I'm good. Good. And let's go. Let's do it. It's exciting for tonight. It is. I think this is, is. a story. I think this is a story a lot of listeners will know, a lot of listeners will see, but a lot of them won't know the full truths behind everything. No. And that's what we're doing tonight is to provide the platform for that truth to be shared as much as needs to be shared. But ultimately to have that open and frank conversation like we do every week with every guest we have. Beautiful. Let's go. So, Rob, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Um, yeah, yes, thank you very much for for having me on. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'm feeling I'm feeling good. It's I think it's going to be a an interesting evening. Um, that, that's a great introduction um, because I think you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of people think they know my story, um, but I suspect they probably don't know everything. Um, and that's what I've been spending effectively the last two two and a half years getting down onto paper. It's going to be exciting and we've got a lot of, it is very fresh and we've got a lot, a lot of questions and, but I think foremost, I think it is the time for you to, 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 to share your story and to hear your voice on it. So I would like to, I, I'd like for you to take us back to the beginning, if you will, um, and just kind of talk us through the early stages of of Rob. No, sure, of, of course. Um, it, it all it all started back in 1999, um, as a lot of stories do uh, at university. Um, and I went to university. Um, uh, I was I went to university in, in Teesside, as was Middlesbrough. Um, I had the time of my life. Fantastic. Um, my first year university, I was have lived my best life. Fantastic. Um, I was away from home for the first time. Um, absolutely, you know, having doing everything I could with as many people as I could. Um, not many girls, um, have to say, um, but uh, that that didn't seem to, to bother me. And it, away we go. Away we went. My second year um, at university, I came back. And I found myself in the um, uh, the Amateur Dramatic Society. And in walked um, uh, a lady uh, called Victoria. And from that point, my life changed um, in ways in which I could never possibly have, have imagined at the time. Um, we ended up together. Um, and from that point, really, um, things started, my life changed subtly at first, um, but more and more dramatically, more and more things became more important and more specifically, she became far more important, um, than anything else in my life. It started slow, um, you know, young romances. You know, and there were good times. You know, we we were head over heels. Um, we we spent a little time together, but over that year, things started be, to become very intense, very very quickly. Um, and young relationships again. You know that that happens a lot. That's not that's not unique. Um, but a lot of people started to say to me, she, "She's around." A lot, you know. You, you, we, we, we miss you. You know, you're not seeing you enough. And all of these new friends that I had made, they were starting to say, yeah, you know, what's going on? And throughout that year, things became more 
insular, more intense. Um, and by the end of that year, I was, I was thinking, you know, th this is probably enough. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm too hard, too fast, too soon. We'll stop. Well, I, we need to have a break. And so the end of that year came and, and, you know, I tried to break it off. Fine. No problem. We both understood. But by the time I came back to university the, the following year after the summer break, we were back together again. And I'm not still not sure exactly how that happened, but she was very insistent. She was, you would leave me messages. She, we, she was very, very, as I say, intense is probably the right word. By the, by that point, um, we decided to move in together. I moved out of the house that I was with my, with my housemates moved out, uh, by the end of my third year, we'd moved in together. And then I stayed around while she finished her studies. And by this, by this point, there was nobody else. There was nobody else in my life at all. So I would go to work. I'd come home, see her. Wouldn't see anybody else. Wouldn't see any friends. Wouldn't see any family. I started to make excuses. And all of a sudden within, you know, two years, two and a half years, she was suddenly my world. She was suddenly everything. And it's only looking back on it when you suddenly start to think that's, that, that is, that's not normal. That's not the way it should have been. Um, and, and really by that point, we, and I use the, the term globally, we were starting to make decisions for us and it, but it wasn't we, she was telling me what I was thinking. And you think, how did I get into that position? And genuinely, because that's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that I come across as, as a particularly susceptible person that, you, you know, we, we all are, we all like our favorite things and all the rest of it. We can be convinced about things, but to be convinced to cut off your family, to be convinced to cut off your friends, to be convinced to to make decisions, life-changing decisions on the whim of someone that you, you know, you don't really know, that, that's, that's an incredible power to have. And that's, as strange as it may seem, that is what was happening. And it happened very, very quickly in terms of, we were not making decisions. I wanted to make sure that she was okay. And the, the way in which that happened is my weakness for that was her weakness. And I, in my book, I, I tell a very specific story um, about the point at which that happened. Um, and I don't want to sort of to give any spoilers, but, but really the point is that she realized at that, at one specific point that by displaying weakness, I would protect her. And I would protect her over and above pretty much anything else that was happening at that time. And I knew that, you know, in those moments, I knew that she was vulnerable. I knew that she needed my protection. And I was the only person that could do that for her. And that was the point that was what she under underlined for me. That was the point that, that she whispered every night that I was the only person that understood. I was the only person that could save her. Um, I was the only person that could stop the bad things from happening. And so when I stop and I think about how, how quickly I was isolated, how quickly my opinion on the world was changed, the, the power of, of this type of suggestion is, I, and I would never have believed that that would have been me, but it is. And it, and it can be, and it, and, and so I understand the power of shame because when you stop and you realize that that is you, you can't tell anybody who are you going to tell? Because as, as a guy who, who do you, you know, you can't tell your mates a, because I didn't have any and B because to admit that you are being led, that you are being convinced and you are and you're doing it not for any good reason but just because 
the moral implication of society says you should is is suddenly not acceptable so i was locked but you know by 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 that point i was locked into a self perpetuating cycle so i moved we, after she finished university we moved down to to falmouth uh, in cornwall to the absolute tip of the country almost again hours you know five hours away from anybody else i knew it was a uh, a geographical isolation just as just as middlesbrough is you know a good 3 hours away from where i grew up and where all my my family are so so cornwall is in the absolute opposite direction it's still just as isolating it's still just as uh, as separating and it was there that we probably I'd say that we had our best times um, because she realized that that her weakness was something that I would respond to. But there, with no one else around, literally nobody, we were in a cottage in the middle of, of a fishing, you know, on the outskirts of a fishing village that had a population of, I don't know, you know, one and a half thousand. It was, t it was tiny. It was a tiny place outside of a tiny place. And, and it was, and it was there we had our best times because it was there that I focused on her exclusively to the, ex to the exclusion of literally everything. Um, and so she, she really lent into that. She managed to get a job. I was there. Um, I was doing a postgraduate diploma in, um, advertising and she, and so in order to do that, she would have to work. Um, and so she got a job, but again, that, that then started a cycle of, of problems because although she, although I could focus on her, she found that actually the job, maybe she didn't want to work. Maybe, maybe there were other things on her mind, but suddenly, of course, she wasn't going to work. She wasn't. Um, doing the things that she was supposed to do. She would stay at home, she would hide. And I was starting to make excuses for her in order to facilitate that. So I was running a sort of a, a blocking system, not just for my work, which I wasn't doing because I was looking after her, but also her work, which she wasn't doing. So what were we doing? You know, for months, it was in the room, curtains drawn, going out to get, you know, to, to, to do the supermarket shop and then rushing back because I got a, a text message to say, where are you? you? You've been out too long. I had to go back. And that, that, that type of control was something that I, I, I hadn't experienced. And I don't, you know, I don't think many men who who haven't been through that would, would probably appreciate because you get a text message from your from the other half boyfriend girlfriend whoever and you think okay well is it reasonable and you react respond uh, accordingly none of these text messages were reasonable but i still responded to them as if they were the most important thing in the world yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to take in up until that point. And obviously, for, for me, listening into that, you, you're getting a lot of sort of manipulation and you're getting sort of guilt and things like that. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've not been to the extent that you have. But coming out of uni, well, being in university, you know, all of a sudden you're at Young Love and, and whatnot. And, and everybody knows, you know, when you first start get, getting with that girlfriend, um, you, you you kind of do push other people's side because it is, it does become that whole heart, you know, that sort of world around you. And I'm just thinking, was there anybody around you saying, look, do you know, we actually think there's something wrong with her or, you know, there's signs of uh, narcissistic behavior or anything like that. Was, was there anybody sort of, you look back now thinking there was somebody there saying that, or was it kind of, 
I, you just had the blinkers on and that was it. Yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, I've had a couple of messages, you know, since since I put the book out and pe since people have seen that I've, I've started to talk about this. I mean, you, you get a lot of people saying, oh, well, you know, of course, of course I knew. I just didn't say anything. Or of course I knew. And, I, you know, I told you that that one time you remember, don't you? And it's like, uh, yeah, you know, do you know what? A couple of people said a couple of times, you know, and you look and if you look on it now, you say, yeah, the, the signs were there. Of course, the, the red flags were there. Absolutely. But did I, would I pay any attention? No, I didn't. I, and, and that is really, really difficult to admit. You know, it is incredibly difficult to say. To say, I, even if someone had sat me down and said, this is what she's doing. I simp I don't think even now I don't think I would have I would have responded I would have said you're the problem you know I was how how was your mind state at that time during them processes of you know moving to down to Cornwall you know did you yourself have these kind of thoughts of hang on something's not right or was you kind of just as you say, blinkered on, drawn in, because you know you, you've got this love and this passion for this woman who you think is your is your world and you care and you're there for this. And my job, I'm here to care for her. I mean, this is what she's telling me. This is what I'm, I I need to be. Hmm. So this is what I'm going to be because we're men. That's what we do. We just follow instructions. Exactly. That's you know what I mean. We we all fall into it. But yeah. uh, and, and was there any times during that where you were like, do, do you know what? This is this is really bad. I need to I need to get out of not just relationship, but how bad did your mental did your mental health get really bad at that point? Uh, not yet. So as 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 we you know as as we go through, I I had I definitely started to realise a little bit later on. Um, at the, at this point, um, I knew I, I I started to think that this probably isn't the way it should be. But I was you know I was naive. I was I was young. I didn't know what a relationship should or should or could be. You know, I hadn't. My, she was my second ever girlfriend, and and she, here and she was telling me that a man should do this. A man should, you know, be this. Um, this is what a man does. This is this is what she wanted in a relationship, and I didn't have a frame of reference. You know, it was it was too difficult to pull away, and that is that's easy for me to say now. And a lot of people won't believe that, but it is absolutely true. I tried multiple times to leave the relationship. And as I say, actually during, after that first year, I left multiple times to, you know, to a, an extent where it became quite problematic, but I always, I, I found myself back in that, in, in that situation, um, being drawn back in. And at that stage, you know, I'm, I'm, I absolutely hold my hand up to say, did I, am I partially responsible for that? Of course, you know, you, you're in a, you're in a, you're in a situation where you, you're not choosing necessarily to be that person because you are, the reinforcement is that's who you're supposed to be. We talk, we do talk about the alpha male a fair bit on on this show you know it, it is a man's job to to provide it is a man's job to do this it is a man's job to do that would i want to ask you now and, and this is kind of you know we i wasn't expecting to go down this avenue well i suppose i would it was really but when when we look at sort of emotional abuse and uh, and physical abuse and and whatnot in when men do it to women why why are we why do we sugarcoat it mm. when it's done the other way you you just said to me there i was partially responsible no you wasn't uh, for for me you wasn't partially responsible for you had these blinkers on and but if if we were talking the other way would you would you be saying i suppose i'm partially at fault you'd be actually saying no you're not at fault mm. what how why do you blame yourself or partially blame yourself? Great question. I think pre partially simply because I am a great believer in, in being able to live up to the responsibilities that you have good or bad. So I, 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 I believe that I, I made choices and they were free choices. 
Um, and some of them were very bad choices. They were led and they were manipulated and they were coercive choices. Um, but I do think that the, the, the groundswell of those choices were, were pre, pre, primarily from a place that I chose to be in. Now, later on, as we go through the story, I, I don't, you know, I don't see that being a, a, partly my responsibility at all. Um, but those early days, the days where I was being set up, for want of a better word, I think that there was there was still time, there was still opportunity. And the reason why I didn't manage to make the break is because I feel that my support network was not strong enough. So, you know, I, I'd love to explore this a little bit more. I really would. Um, but obviously, we've got to get more of it in, and we, we will do. But you, you've, things that you've just said to there, for me, is, is a classic sort of narcissistic behaviour. You know, she's singling you out. I do apologise about that. That's my son in the background. Not you know, at all. It's, it's, I'm under the stairs, you know. So, um, But no, you, you, that sort of classic narcissistic behaviour, you know, you become reliant on that person. She singles you out. She draws you out of everyone. Um, you've got nothing to reference to, um, to how this relationship works. So your decisions that you're making, for me, uh, no, but I know you're saying, oh, but it was my choice to be there, it was my choice to be there. But if you've got these blinkers on, and it, and it is easy to become tunnel visioned in it, you're not seeing that bigger picture. So again, I personally, I don't see you at, at fault in any of this. It, it really is. You've got this tunnel vision going on. You've got the... Um, sort of singling you out, drawing you away from everyone, and you've got this. Like you said, you've got no reference point. So again, how can you blame yourself if the shoe was on the other foot? Would we be having that same conversation? No, absolutely. No, and I and I agree with you. I think it is a really difficult conversation to have, and I think that that you any extra any con any reference of extreme. I think is is probably is is not a helpful one. Um, I, we'll see, you know, as we go through again. I know that we, we haven't got a lot of time, but you know that pattern is a pattern that is repeated yeah. and repeated and repeated. Um, and and so, I suppose, I, I perhaps you know, I am a lot harder on myself than I am on some of the other guys that are going to come later. Um, perhaps that's you know, I, I'm not fixed. Um, I'll be the first to admit that. It takes time to be fixed. It takes it takes time and un, an understanding and a lot of processing needs to still be still be done. It's still it's still raw. It's not it's not something you can click your fingers and everything's happy dory and the, the past is forgotten and you just walk down the the mm. other road. It doesn't work like that. That's not life, unfortunately. It's shit, but it's not mm. life. As we go further on then into your story, what was the process behind the attempts on, on yourself and when the police got involved? What was that like at that moment? How like, scary? Like, was it numbing? What was that like for you at that particular point in your life? And, yeah. Well, it's sort of... So... We're, we're, we're jumping a little bit ahead because you know between between that point uh, and and you know the, when things got you know really bad um of course i managed to get uh, i had a daughter and um i got custody uh, of of her through a, a very long and, and protracted acrimonious um separation divorce um uh, and and some some real serious problems um what followed then was a, a series of events. So the first one, um, and it, it, a spoiler alert, if anybody is thinking about the book, so there, there, are, there are six in total. Um, the first one um, was, um, was my, my car. And my, the, the first suggestion that I thought that some, something was not gonna happen was when the police turned up um, at, at my house, uh, you know, half past five in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. 
and asked me if, if I was okay. And I sort of said, what? Yeah, fine. Um, why? Because my car was supposed to be on fire, but, but of course it wasn't. The next day, two days later, I came downstairs and yeah, so someone had, had firebombed my car, which was next to my house. The house went up, the house went up um, and we all had to, we all had to, to get out. Um, that, at that point, shit got real. Um, you know, things, things were going to get really, really problematic um, because we had moved from a situation where uh, it was, it was, you know, it was adults. We were out, we were talking and, you know, and, and things, things, but as soon as you move into that realm of action, um, it can, it, it, there's no going back from that. Um, that, that happened. And then several years later, it went very quiet for several years. And then the next thing I know, I got a knock on the door and there was a two police officers with a film crew coming into my house. Um, and they then proceeded to tell me that they, that Victoria had been arrested, um, for having a conversation about trying to kill somebody. Um, and that person was me. That's what you saw in the documentary. Um, the, that response was, was a literal response uh, to me having been told that my ex-wife was, was attempting to find somebody to, to kill me. Um, it's, it's not a, an experience that, that I think you can prepare for. It's, it's an, it's an impossible scenario. Um, but one which, I, and I think I even said at the time, uh, one which I, 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 did I believe she'd, she'd go through with it? Yeah. I think she, I think she may well have done if she had given, been given the choice, given the chance. What was your wow. thought process during that time? Obviously having that knock on the door from the police, which would be in a bit like what, what, you know, what the hell's going on? And we're, I'm, we're going to bring you back to the whole court case and that um, as well soon. But what was your thought process once the police was in, involved? Was you kept in the loop? Was you kind of like, is this like a bit of a dream? But how was you pace yourself during that? I was so throughout all of the years. So so this is this was now almost you know seven eight years on. Um, I had kept studious notes, folders and folders and crates. I've got three little sort of five foot crates of paperwork. So I'd kept everything. Um, and all I was thinking was, I'm going to have to go to, I'm going to have to do it again. I'm going to have to do the whole thing again. I'm going to have to move again. I'm going to have to change schools for my, for, 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 for my daughter again. I'm going to have to change jobs again. You know, the whole thing is just, uh, even after all this time, after all this distance, from such a long way away, she can still have the power to change and affect my life here with, you know, I had got remarried. Um, I'd had, a, you know, another child, despite all of that, she was still able to reach out and, and touch my life. And that's what I was thinking. That's what was going through my head. Um, and that, that was, you know, the, the woman who I tried to separate away from, um, so hard um we were still able to do that um and that's that, that's quite demotivating it's, it's very un dispowering unempowering is that the right word um and and that was a really low point um you know that that was a, a sort of a sort of a, 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 a lightning bolt to say you know you're, ne you're never gonna you thought you couldn't get away from her before and you did but you can't, you know, you have to, you have to acknowledge that she will always be there. Um, and you have no idea what she's going to do next. Are you still scared? Are you still scared to this day of what might come? No, no, absolutely. hundred percent not. I, when, when she was sent to prison, I made a, a, a sort of a conscious decision to say, I'm not going to give her that power. I'm not going to give her that agency. 
because she only has that if I choose to give it to her in exactly the same way in in terms of all those years ago, her weakness was my weakness, but that was my ability to give her that. If I choose not to do that, then she doesn't have it. And in exactly the same way, if she wants to find me, she can. You know, I'm not hiding anymore. Um, I'm taking sensible steps. Obviously, I've got a family and they need they need to have, you know, as much reassurance as anybody. But, you know, if 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 it was something that she desperately wanted to do, you know, any private detective would be able to, you know, find me, hunt me down for, you know, however much it costs for have a private detective, no idea. Um, but I can't look over, over my shoulder. You know, that's not a way to live, you know, and because my daughter still has a mum. She's, I mean, she's still there and she is going to be there for the rest of her life as, as well as mine. So I knew that I needed to give her the message to say, you can't be scared of someone, especially not someone who was supposed to be there, who was supposed to love you. Um, so to give her that power is actually doing it yourself a disservice. And she needs to be strong. My daughter needs to be strong. And she needs to have that, those tools to be able to grow up and become the fantastic and beautiful woman that she deserves to be. Do you know what? And, uh, and I, uh, I've got a new perspective on this, obviously, uh, a new child myself and stuff like that. But you showing, you know, and, I, I, and this is a bit where I get a bit emotional now. <laughs> you show, you showing that sort of. We've hit that time um, forty minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, about, it's about time for me. So, um, yeah, you, you showing that sort of mental resilience and that sort of um, understanding and that acceptance. For for me, you you are actually providing probably one of the best life lessons that your daughter could ever be witness to. Um, so I just want to for, for that. I just want to commend you. Um, and say do you know what thank you for sharing that and i've got a huge amount of respect for that it's hard it's uh, ryan it's it's really really hard um and it was hard and you know i would a long uh, you know years ago i wouldn't have said you know that i was in trouble and i didn't for years i said i was fine don't worry about me i'm okay i'm all right and this is this is the power of the, this sort of, I know you've got your book and, and whatnot, and we will come on to that. Um, but this is the power of talking yeah. and the power of communication and the power of acceptance. And the, the, we can do this through multiple vectors of our lives, you know, with our mental health, our physical health and stuff like that. We put things into place to make it happen. But if we sit there and, and let it fester, it's going to eat us up from inside. And, and, and I feel for a while that you did that and it was some there was a realization whether that was through when the cameras walked through the door where, where it was so the, the gavel hit the sort of sort of the the, the, the block and and whatnot what at what point was it that you kind of thought to yourself do you know what i'm free <laughs> um it was exactly it was exactly the same i the same moment i realized that i was free at the same moment in which i also realized that i'm in trouble because that was the point at which I said, I can't, I can't do this on my own anymore because I'm, I mean, I've been carrying this for a long time and I, and it's too heavy and it's too much and I can't do it. And I, and all of a sudden I looked around and I saw all of these people these, the, the, who would, had, who had done that part of the journey with me, who'd had come with me out of this situation and, and they deserved as much as I did to, to, to feel that release, because if I carried it with me, then they would always have, have it with them because that, you know, because I was, I was part of their life and therefore they would have it. And I had to, I had, it was, it was going to absolutely destroy me. And I had to get it out. I started talking to anybody. I was talking to the guy at the bus stop. I was talking to people in the queue. I was, I was talking to anybody who would stand still for more than 10 seconds. Um, and I realized that that something I need to get it out and I need to find a way. And I'm incredibly lucky. And, and this is another reason why I think that I am able to express it um, in a way in which a lot of people, and I know my, my experience is quite 
extreme and it's not necessarily unique but it is extreme um and but a lot of people find that they have aspects of, of my story whether or not it be with the coercive control whether or not it be very you know problematic relationships whether or not it be with the family courts whether or not it be with you know criminal aspects of their relationship um there, there are aspects there but being able to put it all together was was the thing that I need I needed to sort it out I needed to sort of put it put it in a way in which I could start to talk about it reasonably rather than just jumping from topic to topic uh, which is pretty much what I'm doing here with you guys actually <laughs> and well, this is where this is where well, sorry, we kind yeah. of um jump in and we you know we, we like to take our guests on a roller coaster so we, we try and confuse the their mindset because again you will you know you're you're telling your story as you see it and as you've been through it so you will go let's say point a to point b that's that's us as humans that's what we do it's it's for me and ryan to go well let's go from a to c to d to z and and and, and because you get in the the you're not set in a way of especially with where you you know the amount of times you probably have you know you've told the story now you'll be set kind of in a parallel but I, I want to come back to you mentioned the family courts and I know there's going to be listeners out there that will be going through that or have been through that. And I think it's a great topic to discuss with yourself who's had that experience. So the family court story for you then, what what was it and and how was it for you? Awful. I mean, it was really bad. Um from pretty much start to finish but i have to be careful because unfortunately the way in which the family court system works here is is that you can't talk about any specific details about what happened within the family court um i can only publicly here share what happened before and the results of what happened afterwards and you know if if i was to go through what what happened within that you know then uh, there would be there would be ramifications which you know, which were problematic um but my experience was 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 crazy it was really bad really really terrible because you know over the course of you know multiple years four five years you know as many different cases court cases um ranging from you know simple contact orders all the way through to um almost um well you know victoria tried to to take the kids off to germany and tried to leave the country and 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 you know that that extremely extreme shift from what i thought the courts were supposed to do versus what they actually did um was a was a was a real eye opener i was not expecting i think i like a lot of guys, uh, men actually, and, and women here, you know, who think that, you know, they go through, they, they have, they have separations, which are, which are not great and they can't make the decisions. And you've got two people who are, you, you can't agree um, with, you know, with the, with the children involved. And I think if I can just get to court, the court will be fair. It'll, it'll decide it'll be, everything will be fine. And then we'll all be able to move on. The reality of that, for me, and I think the reality of that for quite a considerable number um, of separated fathers, particularly, is that that is not the case. Um, the The default can be as little as what happened to me, um, which is every two weeks you get the best part of less than twenty four hours with your with with your with your child, and for someone who is an engaged father who is trying to do to try to be a father i mean let, let's let's be absolute let's be frank about it you're just trying to be a father you're just trying to be a dad you know and you're doing the absolutely best thing that you possibly can do but you you can only do it in a such a small window and in order to in order to to be better in order to be a better person be a better dad be a better man you have to then fight even harder and that can't be right 
that that can't be the way in which we think that a a good parent would have to to do uh, and me uh, as a parent me as someone who was trying to get trying to navigate through that system who was staring down the barrel of thousands of pounds of hundreds of thousands of, of man hours trying to navigate a system which is designed to be incomprehensible you're not supposed to understand how it works against someone who who we can now acknowledge actively manipulates the system actively games and 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 tries to genuinely confuse the very institutions that are supposed to protect the independence and look out for the kids i mean it's it's it it, it was a disaster from start to finish say that i mean I, I i don't we don't like talking about other people's truths and how they work and stuff but but from what you're saying and the way it was portrayed on tv that was very very clear the way you know when she was arrested they, they wanted to interview and she was like well i've got this pain i need to go and get checked at the hospital to try and push that back so that was very very clear and and one of your other experiences there about you know about that sort of not designed to to kind of support and and help you grasp what what's going on you know f for me was very very apparent when when my, my son was born you know my wife was that you know i left the room to get i can't remember if it was food but toilet my wife was asked is everything is okay mm. at home okay is he all right at home but on the flip side of that nobody actually come up and asked me yeah. and and that and it, so you, from what you're saying it's it's quite it's quite evident through society that it's there at the beginning there and all the way through. So yeah, it's obviously not to your extreme, but I've, I've had that sort of feeling and, and yeah, I, I sympathize with mm. that. So, so uh, absolutely. That, one of the things that I, I... so sorry, Rob, um, during that time, just uh, during that time for the family courts, obviously the kids were living with her, that correct? Yeah. yeah. And you'd see him every kind of like, two weeks on a basis how did you keep yourself going firstly how did you keep yourself going through that point which i know would be you know as dad's here it is fucking hard but also i'm going to ask a bit of a deep question uh that i think a lot of people are always scared to ask it but we always do ask it did at any time during that period did you have thoughts of ending it did you have thoughts of why what is the, my purpose why am i here yeah, great question. Um, I came up against. I d well, to be to be clear, I didn't think I didn't think about ending it, ending it for me personally. I definitely did think about, you know, how to walk away. Should I walk away? Is it the right thing to walk away? Um, and what got me through. I, and it was as a, you know I talked earlier about how hard it is and it is impossibly hard I mean I don't think that there is enough credit I don't think that we we talk enough about people who who do go through these incredibly battering experiences because it is really and you come out and change person after that um and there were definitely times when I I looked at and I said I you know I can't do it I shouldn't do it. Actually, I'm I am perpetuating the problem. You know, by going back and back and back and back, I'm causing this problem. If if I stopped, then this would all go away. Um and what got me through was I would then I would then look back and I looked at my daughter and I and I said to myself, what message does that give her? Actually, you know, because I would be, I would be, when she came back to me, this, and this is a story which I've not told anybody actually. Um, I, I, Exclusive. I know, yeah. It's not in the book or anything. You know, this is, this is just for you guys. One of the things I did say to my, to, to myself was when she, when she's 20 and she, and I, and I leave, when she comes back to find me, because I would always believe that she would come and find me at some point how could I justify what, how could I justify leaving? And I couldn't, I, I couldn't justify stopping. I couldn't justify 
to myself talking to her in my imagination to say that not fighting for you was the right thing because I knew that life with her mum was not what she deserved wasn't that would not give her the life that she needed that she deserved that she needed and so by giving up I would I wouldn't be able to look at myself I wouldn't be able to 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 be the man the man that I thought I needed to be for her it was a different kind of man to the one that Victoria told me I should have been but it was it was the right kind of man it was the right kind of father um and that's what got me through and i think that that's why i think that's why i think I'll right there everything. is the is the correct part is it's not that's this as you say it's not that's the right man that is the right father and that's what you done it's all good us being men mm. alphas you know top of the the boy's boy the bloke exactly. the manly bloke no at that moment in time <laughs> you were being the father that you needed to be you were being the father that you knew that she needed that she needed to be and that's that she needed to be yes yeah, that main, she needed and that is correct but the biggest thing out of that was that it's not again it's not you being like the right man it's not it's you just being the father that you your, your daughter needed at that time and, and still needs today and will need for the next 20 30 40 50 years plus do you know what i mean you'll still be the same father then as what you will be walking down the aisle 100 percent. who as who we are as dads it's what we do but that smile there got you exactly exactly and <laughs> <laughs> yeah a hundred percent and 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 that is that was the realization that it's not what you're told you should be it's what you know you should be you know you you don't get told what the right thing to do is because no one tells you the one the one piece of advice that i was told years ago which which uh, as a, you know as coming back from from the, the birth of my daughter it was like you're going to get it wrong you you a hundred percent. No one's gonna you're gonna get it wrong, and you're gonna hate yourself for it because it, it you know you can't get it right. And that, but that's okay. It's okay to get it wrong because you will know that you've got it wrong, and you will do better next time. And that piece of advice is like, do you know what? That's a great piece of advice because all of a sudden the acceptance of getting something wrong, but being able to get it right and understand what you need to do to get it right is not people can't tell you that you they should they, you know it's it's about you understanding what you need to do for you, for your child you know that's the perfect way fantastic fantastic no no no, no. So, right anyway that was brilliant i love that i love that we got got some stuff there anyway i do want to come back into why you're here and I kind of want to come into your headspace around the whole police. And mm -hmm. you're, you're coming to the, towards the end of, you know, going through, you, you know, being interviewed and stuff like mm -hmm. that. How How is your mental health going through sort of that time? Yeah, so uh, it, it was, um, so during that time, that was, that was a pretty dark place. I wasn't lonely anymore. I had a, a you know, I had a fantastic wife was incredibly supportive um i had a, a a new a new baby daughter um so things things were going well and if going you know they were settling down for me things things were were what as i understood you know and victoria had disappeared for a long time long enough for me to to perhaps you know not recognize that things were still a problem but it was that that switch back as soon as the police got involved again as soon as everything i started to learn you know this guy this guy this guy this guy all of a sudden everything started mounting up and and everything that i thought i had dealt with no definitely hadn't um and you know i talk about uh, you know a box and when i was with victoria i was you know i was stuffing all of this into a box you know, I know the color of it. I know how it looks like. I know the feel of it. I know the smell of it. I know everything. And you know, it's, it's, it's my box and it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's sort of everything, everything, every problem is, is sort of stuffed into this. And I'd put it away for a long, long time. And then when this whole thing started up again, 
it's like boom i was i was right back there when i saw the documentary for the first time i could i could smell the 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 hospital smell i could i could hear everything it was like being back there it was the flashback was real it was it was something that i had never experienced before um and and with that it came as a crashing crashing blow and then and that's when i sort of i started thinking to myself you know this isn't i'm not right which is again which is the second time it's really really difficult to admit it's really really difficult to start saying to to, to people that who who think they know you who think that you know that um that everything is go is going well that you, you're not you're not okay this is not going to end well if i don't do something to help me and to help to help you know those around me this is this is going to go sideways and it's going to go sideways really quickly um and and really getting to the end of the trial getting to the end of the police involvement as i've you know as i sort of slightly mentioned there that became a point which to say I could finally talk about it. I couldn't talk about it before. And one of the things which I don't think, I, I don't think this is just me because I've, I've spoken to people who, who have experienced this as well. When, when I say I can't, I couldn't talk about it. I, I physically couldn't talk. When people would ask me a question, my, my mouth would freeze, it would lock and you know all i would just stare blankly and i was like I, i'm trying to tell you how i feel but i can't i i just couldn't the, the the weren't the words and you know as you can tell sort of speaking to you i'm not shy in in talking i'm not shy in finding you know words and the right words but there were situations there were there were circumstances where you just i couldn't it was physically impossible so words were there but it wouldn't it wouldn't physically come out and i've i, I fully exactly. understand because i've been in that same position with, with when my Absolutely. very first started and i had to you know obviously wanting to talk and wanting to get out there mm. it was like i i what up like how about yes. just say it exactly. i know can i write can, oh, can so got like, paper? Can I write it down what can i do but when were you yeah. spoke a minute ago about you know you kind of find it you you didn't know at that point who to kind of talk to, who to turn to, who, who to speak to. How did you approach that subject with, you know, family and friends around you, obviously your partner? Like, how did you, did, did, that, did they approach you or did you approach them? Because again, this is something people really struggle with mm. is having that conversation, that fear of judgment is so powerful. Mm. People forget about it. So how did you yeah. go about doing that? Oh, a great question because you're absolutely right the the the, the sh and, and you use the word shame you know the, the your pride um is is incredibly powerful thing and it stops you from doing so many you know so many problems um and so th th it was difficult for me and what what helped me was was first of all writing it down so first of all you know just trying to get something onto paper it wasn't for anybody else it was it was just me it was it was just to, to to get it down on paper and then from there over the you know over the dinner table uh with you know just with just my wife and it was just just my wife from there i would i could talk about something and it was like almost not bullet points not single words but it was bullet point topics that i could say i've been thinking about this and 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 you know and it's not a it's not a an admission it's not something that says i'm weak it's to say do you know what's been on my mind recently over the past couple of days you know what this is this is what i've been thinking about um and it's it's a i use that i use that as a way of easing into a, and as the conversation then became easier actually I could say, I could move from I've been thinking about to I'm worried about. And I could move from I'm worried about to I, I, I what, you know, I'm a bit concerned that this is going to happen. I am. I am, exactly. I am. Yeah. 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 And saying that is hard, isn't it? Oh, it's saying that is hard. Even I now. Am. Even now. It is. I. <laughs> 
I had a I'm back in with my counselor. I'm I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm back with my counselor, and I always speak third person. It's a very military thing. We always speak third person. So for her to go to me like, no, say I, like, oh, we're having a really bad day today. No, say I'm having a really bad day because it's you that's going through it. But saying yeah. it is very difficult, and it's very kind Good. of like it makes it real. That's what it does. It makes it real. But when you sat down mm. at that table, because I think the way you've yes. done it is fantastic by writing it down, getting your thoughts on paper to understand it yourself, to then sit your wife down and go, listen, go through the stages. How was that received? Well, really well. I mean, first of all, let me say my wife is incredible. I mean, she is my moral compass. I mean, she absolutely, she tells me when I'm getting it wrong. She's, she tells me when I'm getting it right. Um, and she, you know, and she is incredible in every, in every sense of the word. Um, and what really helps is, is we have a technique and I'll, I'll give this, this is, this is yours for free guys. You can take this with you. So, every, so about two or three times a week, we sit down over dinner and we say, right, and we go around the table, everybody at the table, give me two good things and one bad thing about what happened to you today. And everybody has to say two good things and one bad thing. And it could be absolutely anything. There's the, and then we talk about why they're good and we talk about why it's bad. And, you know, and honestly, and that as a conversation starter is second to none. That I love because Ryan's just done Absolutely. the motion. And I think Jack's up the same I'm going to take your idea, because again, it's what we used to do uh, in the army when we would give um, recruits, other people, feedback. You would give them what is the bathtub method, which is you would give them a positive yeah. to get them, you know, obviously really high, but then you'd give them a negative to work on, and then you finish with a positive. So you saying that, and Ryan doing the bath motion brought back so many memories then for me. I was having flashbacks <laughs> of some really bad times. But it's incredible, though, on how actually when you sit down and you open yourself up and you have these conversations with the ones you love and how they actually receive it, because again, there's that fear out there. Mm. So, listeners, if you are genuinely struggling if you want to chat do what rob said write it down understand your own reasoning why sit down with your loved ones and slowly work your way through it because don't be fearful of them judging you because it will not happen open up use your voice have that conversation rob has done it i've done it brian's done it and as brian's about to say it shows that it works it shows you the value of that that sit down time as a family sitting down, turning the TV on, mm. putting your phones down and just half hour, a couple of times, it doesn't have to be every day, whether it's breakfast, whether it's dinner, just sitting down and just talking because the value that you can get from that is better than any form of, for me, any form of counselling out there. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. It's, you know, it, and it's, it's getting, if you do it with the kids and that means that actually they start to understand why it's important as well, because the stuff that they're worried about, you don't know what they're worried about until you ask them and, and, and they've got to be able to tell you what it is that they're worried about. And I, and I tell you what, when I tell my kids what I'm, what I'm worried about, their perspective on it is like, well, of course, why didn't I think of it that way? Of, yeah. of course. I mean, they, and they don't judge you. They, they've got no, absolutely no reason. They think you're the, they're absolutely fantastic and incredible. It, whatever happens. Don't hide it. You know, if, if there's something genuine on you, you know, obviously you've got to put it in such a way that they're going to understand. But, they, you know, they don't, don't, you know, don't hide because they can sense it. You know, I was I, a few weeks back, I was having a really bad day. I'd, I'd found out uh, a couple of days before that a friend had taken his life that I went to school with and I was feeling quite low and I had, I had my, my, my kid and it was, you know, he was there and he was just rocketing in my head and he's, it wouldn't stop. And to the point where my neighbour, no, my neighbour doesn't normally say anything, but when Rachel got home, my neighbour turned around and went, Ollie's been kicking off, you know. <laughs> and and I just hand, hand him over and that was it, gone. I had to get out of the house for a half hour just to clear my head. And it and it just goes to show, you know, just having that sort of five minutes in such a way to explain it will make it a lot better. Uh, uh, so 
Yeah, so carry on. Okay, carry no, no, on. No, I was, no, you're quite right. I was, you know, I was just going to... The only thing I'd say is, you know, the the ability to understand why you're feeling the way you are is is, is really, really useful because you can... you Once you understand why you're feeling that, then you can do something about it. And you can, if you need to change it, then you can. Um, mm. And, you know, the, the best way to do that is is by talking about it. The what's, the where's, the why's. Yeah. What's going on? Why is it happening? Where do we need to go? When you understand Amazing. the why, you know how to do the how. So I do want to come on to something, to this. I want to come on to this. A book in front. Well, I've got a book in front of me. Jack wasn't good enough to get one, so um, <laughs> sorry. Jack. Chilling no, story. Brian's going to read it to me. A, a chilling true story of lies and deception. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. Mar- married to the Black Widow. So let's go from the top, Rob. Let's go. Thank you. What? 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 Well, to be fair, how long did it take? But the the main thing for me is why. What made you think? Do you know what? I need to write a book. That there that Ryan's holding, that is my therapy. That was the way in which I had, I knew I knew I had to talk to somebody. I was talking to anybody. I was talking to strangers, talking to everybody who, who would listen, a, a lot of people who wouldn't. Um, and so I, need, I knew I needed to get it out. I needed to have an understand about why, because I didn't know why Victoria had done what she did. And I needed to sort of, I needed to question our life together and what, what it meant. And I started to write it um, when she was sentenced. So, you know, it took me about 18 months to write in total. It started as a, as a letter. So I wanted to write a letter to my daughter to say, this is why we are where we are. This is why we are who we are. This is our story. This is this is what happened. And I wanted it to be as true as I could possibly, possibly make it. I wanted to have all the terrible bits. I wanted to have all the fantastic bits. I wanted to have the beautiful bits. I wanted her to know that there was, it, it wasn't her life is was not a terrible life. Her life started in a, a hugely, you know, with love and with respect and with a fantastic sense of being. There were a certain series of events which led us to to where we are now, and I wanted her to understand why those happened, and I wanted her to understand the people involved in those events in in both the good and the bad because you know we mentioned in our previous conversation her mum is going to be her mum for her entire life and she shouldn't be have to run away from that she should be able to understand it and the only way in which she's going to be able to understand it is if i help her and so i wanted her to understand the good and the bad bits, and that's what I'm. I hope I managed to to do. I think that's fantastic that you've that you've actually done and spoke about the good and the bad, and you've not gone. This is just the bad. This is you know, do you know what I mean. You've not gone down that avenue of like right. This is what this your mum was. She yeah, was. She was which, this. You know, she was this. She was this. By all means, and a lot of people may have done and roles reversed, but you've actually gone. Do you know what? There have been some fantastic times. Like, I, you know, I've got an, an ex-wife and we're divorced and that, but we had some fantastic times, but it didn't work out. And now we have a new, new partner and we're having fantastic times. Like, there is mental health. It's good and bad. Like, grasp both of them. Learn from both of them. Exactly. Like, don't just go down one road. It doesn't work. A- absolutely. But how was the thought process when... when when writing, yeah, for what sure. was the thought process like for you as well? Like, as you going through it, did you kind of find, um, what's the word? Not not revelations, but did you did did you actually find a better, a clearer understanding? 
Yeah, catharsis. Um, it, it, it definitely has it has a a sense of catharsis for me. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, have I got closure? Um, no. <laughs> um, I think I think we've uh, you know just by listening tonight, I can clearly listen. That you know, there's there's a lot of still raw emotions there. You're still troubling to sort of process. You're still troubling to put that I am onto it. Of course. You know, so yeah, it's. I just, yeah, I just think it's absolutely amazing that you can accept it and understand it, but you still don't know what to do with it. Uh, you know, you show me someone who does know. You know, yeah. uh, honestly, you know, I think for for me, li- life is a exactly, <laughs> life is a series of learnings. You've got to, you've got to learn because I I I firmly believe that you are, you you can un- recognize the good once you understand the bad. You know. Yeah. And, and and you've got to have. I, for me, I've got experience of both, um, and so you know, to to try and make sense of that in the in the most positive way. Because the the other thing is this life. You've got to put something into life that you didn't get out. You know, and and the best way to do that, and the best way to to make a positive impact, and to be the role model for my daughters to be that positive role model is, is to live it is to make sure you say, look, this is what happened to us. Yeah. And it was terrible. It was awful. And I, and I wish it hadn't happened, but it did. So what can we do to make sure that, that we've learned from that and to make sure that we help other people who are suffering from the same thing? I wonder um, how is, how's life now for Rob since, since, you know, you've, you've, written this you know incredible book detailing your life you know you've had it's obviously you've had the aspect of the tv on 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 and that but how is life for rob now hard tough um i don't have the same types of problems but i've got problems you know um i've got different problems i've got you know i've got life problems i've got um mortgage problems i've got interest rate problems i've got debt problems i've got you know so many different types of problems that everybody has and what i think is reassuring for me is that those those i i i lean into those problems because i don't have my old problems anymore you know i i have a sense of perspective that you only get when you've stared down the barrel of a gun, you know, figuratively, literally, um, and, and, and you come out the other side, you know, I am no longer afraid of getting things wrong. I'm no longer afraid of, of, of facing problems, which seem insurmountable because, you know, I've, I look around me and I see the most important things in my life are here and they're not going anywhere. Um, and, to answer your question jack life is pretty great despite all of those problems despite all of those things that are going wrong the world is going you know to hell in a handbag but my family are here and no matter what everything else looks like we're in the right place and we're doing the right thing and that's what matters oh, you know and and there is so much in that and and we've had so many guests on coming the past couple of weeks that have that similar message you know there are going to be hard times there are going to be times where you think do you know what i can't move forward but this this is the time where we learn this is the time where we can you know dig dig deep and get strong and when we come out of it the problems are still going to be there but we're going to be able to grasp them a lot better and we're going to be able to go further and and i think there's a lot of uh, a lot in in what you've just said but going back to your book where where can people find it where can people sort of get it where where can they go and purchase it well i mean amazon is the is the biggest bookshop in the world um so you know you can always get it there you can order it from from uh, you know all your main bookshops you know waterstones and all the rest of it um you know you can you can ask them to to get it in and they'll get it in for you so you know it's 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 available pretty much anywhere you 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 get your normal books fantastic so 
Oh, there's just <laughs> so much that I want to go for and, <laughs> and do, but we, we are running out of time, unfortunately. So do you have any sort of final thoughts for, you know, sort of last messages for people out there or, you know, people that are, you might, might be in that sort of situation where you've been yourself, you know, you've been trapped or, you know, you, you, you feel that there's no way out. Is there anything that you can kind of just, sum up in like a sentence or two to just maybe inspire that one one person you know I, I really hope so i really hope so for me what what the difference was was one person asking one question and that gave me the hope the 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 imagination to understand and believe i could change my life understand that you can be as strong as you like but you can't do it by yourself. Powerful. Fantastic. So, do you, you got any final? I just want to say thank you. I, I really do want to say thank you. I want to say, you know, thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us. Thank you for opening up with us and having an open and frank conversation. Um, you know, we we both understand how sometimes how hard it can be to, to to talk, and I feel like I feel like in this. In these episodes that you've actually found a little bit more within yourself if you don't mind me saying i feel like you've you've been able to answer a few questions of your own which is really really powerful and your story is powerful and you're doing an incredible job um so be proud of yourself and what you are doing and your kids will be very very proud of you as well so thank you for that and guys make sure you go grab a book have a sit down have a read and most importantly Go and have that conversation. Absolutely. So, guys, you know, I want to thank Rob Parks for coming on. Author of a mind-blowing book, True Story, Married to the Black Widow. Um, Rob, thank you from literally everybody out there, but more for, from myself. I mean, I remember watching the episode air. Uh, and then the following morning, I get a message, and I was thinking the night before, "That well, that'd be a great guest." So, I just, I just think that there might be something there, mate. We, we might be able to coin that one or something. But no, honestly, honestly, um, it really has been a privilege listening to your story, um, getting the snippets that aren't in the book. Uh, you know, we will get this out as two specials. But guys, as I always end the show, stand up, speak out, and remember. Use your voice.